right? So here we go. Um, we have covered the Beatles many, many times. Um, I have not gone through the all the episodes you can uh, hear them in, but <laughs> if you want to, with the Beatles episode four, Beatles for Sale episode seven, Please Please Me episode 17, Hard Day's Night 21, Help 23, Magical Mystery Tour 26, Rubber Soul 28, White Album 30, Sergeant Pepper 31, Revolver 32, and Abbey Road 34. Oh, so good we're going to, I you... think, add that to your number titles, like where we were, where we said the group before, Matt. Could you add yes, that to your accounting should, duties? Uh, uh, give me, uh, I'll be cleaning the stacks. Um, nice. But uh, yeah, you can, if you want the history... <laughs> Up until then, you could go through all of those uh, Matt's episodes. Oral history. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, but this is all kind of a weird album because even though it's their last, the last album that they released, um, it was released on May eighth, nineteen seventy, which was actually a month after the band had officially broken up. Um, it, it was not the last album that they recorded. We talked about that with Abbey Road. So um, it depends on how, what your perspective is. I've always looked at it as Abbey Road is their true last album, um, and, but this one's just released late because of a lot of hangups, which I'll get to in just a minute. Uh, it did chop the charts, but it was not. It did not fare well critically overall for for a Beatles record. So this album comes. The recording of this album comes in the, a couple of months uh, after the White Album was released in 19, late 1968. Uh, and it it started from a desire from Paul McCartney to get back to kind of the, the roots of the Beatles and stop with the experimentation and kind of just do an album straight up that could be played live, you know, without many effects in the studio. And he had the idea of of doing the rehearsals for this with a film crew around that would uh, that would film them the writing those songs and and, and rehearsing them and then um, they would they would eventually play the songs in a live concert in a big concert venue and then release the movie and then have the album soundtrack and uh, and that's kind of what uh, what the the idea was so they ended up booking a month at Twickenham Film Studios which was the um, the same location that they recorded or they filmed their promo films for the singles Revolution and um, uh, Hey Jude. And they had a fairly positive experience there. So they decided, you know, let's go there, have all the uh, the filming done there. Uh, uh, but it was, and so it was basically like a huge warehouse that they were in. And they picked January as the, uh, January 1969 is the month to do this because they had actually sandwiched in between uh, George Harrison's trip to the United States in December of 69 and Ringo, if you guys remember from the Abbey Road episode, Ringo had commitments to star in The Magic Christian, the film that he was starring in with Peter Sellers, and he had to do that in February. So they had about a month, and that's when they booked the studio. So the recordings were just of the bands playing together, no overdubs or manipulations. It was just straight up, you know, kind of going back to their roots. But the rehearsals did not go well. Uh, right off the bat, the, you know, the studio was cold and uncomfortable. The film crew was kind of seen as intrusive with all the, you know, the people and the cameras and the lighting. Uh, Lennon and, Oko had, and Yoko Ono had descended into pretty deep heroin addiction. Um, oh, and that was partly, I didn't know that. yeah, yeah, they were, it was partly credited to, well, there was a previous drug bust that they were both arrested for. And, um, Yoko Ono also had a miscarriage, so they were pretty, um, heartbroken about that. And so they started getting into heroin and Lennon really wasn't, um, he was kind of aloof throughout the whole, you know, recordings um, for all the recordings and, uh, you know, was kind of aggressive and, and <laughs> did really treat everybody in, in the best way possible. Uh, uh, this was particularly uh, difficult for George Harrison because he actually had a really good time in the United States. He was hanging out with Bob Dylan and the band in uh, Woodstock, and they just had a great, you know, camaraderie, a great experience. And so he actually arrived at Twickenham with, you know, being very positive, uh, but was quick to, uh, you know, get set off by McCartney's kind of overbearing nature and, you know, kind of how his the way that he would just control things. And the fact that Lennon was just so aloof and not really invested into the into the project. And so he actually uh, quit the band. <laughs> it's like all the just various members decide to quit the Beatles for short periods of time around around here. And uh, George quit on January 10th. He did return about a week later, but he uh, had a couple of demands. One is which that they would actually leave Twickenham Studios and they would go back to Apple. Uh, to finish the recording, and he also wanted to bring in Billy Preston, uh, the keyboard player, who, um, you know, George Harrison said, you know, if we have somebody else in the uh, you know, in the studio with us, kind of an outsider, people are going to be on their best behaviors, and that might help the um, the camaraderie of, with the band. So, so Billy Preston does come into play, and you hear him all over this record. Um, hmm. it, it, let it be. 
So they also culminated at the, at the end of the recording of this album, they decided to actually do a live uh, performance, but they couldn't really agree on exactly where to go. A lot of different ideas were uh, were, were thrown out there, uh, but they just decided, let's just not have to travel anywhere and do the concert on the roof of Apple Studios. So that's what they did on January 30th, and they played for about 45 minutes before the cops came along and uh, forced them to turn off the uh, turn off this, the uh, the the the, the, the speakers um, but they actually three of the three of the songs that they um, played on the roof the recordings from that were actually put onto this album and that includes dig a pony I've got a feeling and one after 909 hmm. and this also represents the last uh, Beatles live performance so here comes the fun part this is the, this is the, the aftermath of this is the really interesting part because the original recordings were re were produced by George Martin and Glenn Johns was brought in to be the engineer and his he, he mixes the album together but the band rejected the mix um, and so they then went on to record Abbey Road and later on in the fall their new manager Alan Klein at the uh, request of Lennon and Harrison um, Actually, this is before that. He Alan Klein decides to release the footage uh, of the of the uh, that was recorded at Twickenham Film Studios to make the film "Let It Be," and so he wanted the soundtrack. And so again, he gets Glenn Johns to come in to mix a recording of the soundtrack. But again, that's that is rejected by the band. They're thinking thinking that it's substandard. Um, so that's when Lennon and um, uh, uh, Harrison, you know, basically later tell Alan Klein, hey, go get, give these tapes to Phil Spector. Uh, he will do the, the production work on it. Um, so Phil Spector gets in there and he layers orchestrations over three songs, including Paul McCartney's Long and Winding Road. Um, and uh, there was some reports that McCartney was okay with this because Phil Spector said, you know, after he made the, the, the final mixes, he sent it out to all the band members. They all approved it. So that's what they did. But later on, McCartney we just hated the over overproduction of the uh of the orchestration the chorus that was there and um and, <laughs> and later on in 2003 phil Spector called mccartney's criticism quote hypocritical and he alleged that paul had no problem picking up the academy award for the let it be movie soundtrack <laughs> nor did he have any problem in my in using my arrangement of the string and horn and choir parts when he performed it during 25 years of touring on his own if paul wants <laughs> if paul wants to get into a pissing contest about it he's got me mixed up with someone who gives a shit um, <laughs> so, so i I'm, I, yeah, and I'll tip my head right now. I'm not a big fan of the Long and Winding Road, my, but I do appreciate it because it gives us wonderful this wonderful story about that. I mean, that's kind of like the the main thing that kind of comes out of this is how much McCarty hated the overproduction uh, of this record. Um, however, George Martin also did not like what what uh, what Phil Spector did, um, and he said that it was basically was uncharacteristic of the sounds the Beatles had always uh, you know used. He said, and famously, George Martin said that this should have read produced by George Martin and overproduced by Phil Spector. <laughs> and interestingly enough, George Martin did not get a production credit on this. This is credited totally to Phil Spector because he was the one that finally, he was the last one to, to, to have hands on it. So, Matt, have they released, I mean, do they have other bootlegs of the other track? Oh yeah, Other that was versions. Let It Be Naked, man. That yeah, was that was a big song, Paul. Yes, yeah. Let It Be Naked released in 2003, which I'll talk about in just a second. But that okay. was Paul McCartney basically saying, all right, let's 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 release this album the way that it should have been, which was more stripped down. Because think about it, again, the original intent, at least from McCartney's perspective, was to do an album that's just straight up, you know, no frills, just do a, a rock album. And, and you're not really getting that with what Spectre did. Oh, um, okay. So, uh, so the other thing... <laughs> I have to give Lennon's quote here. Uh, the the other members basically said that when this was released, this was the you know kind of version that they wanted. And John himself said, quote, when Spectre came in, it was go and do your audition. And he worked like a pig on it. He'd always wanted to work with the Beatles and he was given this shittiest load of badly recorded shit without a lousy feeling, <laughs> with, a, with a lousy feeling to it ever. And he made something out of it. He did a great job. When I heard it, I didn't puke. <laughs> so, Back so that is, compliment. Yeah, ex yeah. So, um, so that's kind of the big controversy with this here. Um, and uh, I have well, a really couple was of... three of the Beatles liked it, right? And it was only McCartney that really hated it, if I remember at correctly. The yeah, at the time, yeah. yes. Um, but uh, yeah, but even though McCartney said initially, I think what happened is McCartney said, "Yeah, it's fine." And then you know, because he was kind of doing his own thing, working on his own album, um, his his first solo album. And then I think he listened to it 
later on a couple of times. And the more he listened to it, the more he hated it. And he actually reached out to Alan Klein and to uh, Phil Spector and, you know, insisted that they change even after it was released, that, that they change certain aspects of it and they just wouldn't yeah. do it. So he sent you know. a hilariously fucking Paul McCartney letter that if you ever want to look at it, I remember when Let It Be Naked came out, there's yeah. like there's a copy of the letter. It's fantastic. It's exactly the letter you think Paul McCartney would send to Phil Spector. And it's exactly the type of letter that you would imagine Phil Spector like showing up with a gun at his house like to respond to. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I always like that story better than the actual song. Um, but uh, <laughs> so. All right. I have a couple other things to talk about in the aftermath here, but um, let's uh, let's go with our reactions. Let's see. It's Josh's turn, I think. So, Josh, what are your thoughts on Let It Be? Yeah, I I like this album. Um, it does sound different than the other albums, you know, especially Abbey Road, since that's the closest one to it. Um, I can hear the layering and the wall of the quote unquote wall of sound on it, but I don't feel like it's uh, detracts from my experience. Um, mm-hmm. There's a little bit of a I feel like there's a little bit of banter on some of the tracks, which makes it kind of feel more of like a hangout album. I don't know why, you know, either I feel like they half ass that part, like either do it more and like make it feel more of like a hangout album or just cut it out completely. Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of feels half done or half thought out on that. It, this album in a way does feel like a final album to me in a way that Abbey Road didn't. Um, I don't know exactly why why it does maybe long and winding road just sounds like a final song (laughs) Mm. but you've got some great you've got some great tracks on this Uh, i am interested i'm gonna listen to that let it be naked it is on spotify so i'm gonna see if i can tell the difference or um see if i can catch it now but um i think you start off strong on this album with two of us and dig a pony those are great songs there's great production sound on it um dig a pony ironically sounds like joe cocker who covered a little help with a little help for my friends it almost sounds mm. like his version of that song or something um i'm not i'm not a fan of uh, across the universe really mm. but i do like um, some of the other songs um, like I Me Mine gets in your head and I've got a feeling I like I've got a feeling because it's like they each get their own part um, which they don't really do and I can't think of any times when they each kind of get their own singing verse um, separately by themselves. Well they do there's the, earlier on they did like something like um, you know uh, we can work it out is it's a very uh, much the same song as that because because those the parts that they're singing are the parts that they wrote and that song in particular was Paul had part of the song and John had another part of a song and then they mm-hmm. put it together kind of like what they did with, you know, um, yeah, we can work it out and uh, uh, a day in the life very similar to that. Mm-hmm. So they, they did do that, but it had been a while since you really saw that, you yeah. know, in the latter part of the sixties long enough that I forgot about it. So. Yeah. Right. And um, the, the other thing that kind of feels like out of place is they have these two very short song snippets in there that are just kind of also throw away from Maggie May and I can't remember the other dig one. It. Yeah, dig, dig it. it yep. Which is like 30 seconds or less actually. And um, so I don't know why they did that. It's another part of like, you know, almost like sketches or, or something. Why not just uh, do more of that or, or just leave it out entirely. So this kind of feels like an experimental album in that way, or just kind of like uh, almost like a B-sides album, even though they're not B-side songs, but uh, just like extra stuff for the fans almost. But then you close on I, on Get Back, which I love the opening of I Get Back. It, every time I hear it, it gets me excited, mm. and it's just such a good song. So it's not like they're, <laughs> they've are they suddenly like lost their talent, and they're just like... Uh, you know, just struggling to produce stuff. They clearly still have material and they still have all of the skill set and, and, um, you know, the camaraderie and and chemistry together to Mm -hmm. make an album, but it, it doesn't, um, it, I don't know. I liked it more than Abbey road getting to my rankings. I have it. I have it. No, I don't have it more than Abbey Road. I'm sorry. (laughs) I have it ranked nine overall in between Please Please Me and Magical Mystery Tour. So uh, Abbey Road, I have at seven. Okay. So it's it's an interesting Beatles experiment. You still have catchy songs. You still have um, a good deep cuts on here, things that you forget about. But it just doesn't all come together for me in a coherent album. 
All right. John, yeah. what do you think? I, I don't like this album a lot at all, mm. to be honest. It's always the Beatles album from the late career that I have never liked. Hmm. I think it's interesting for all of the talk about Spectre on it. He does like when you listen to Let It Be, you know, you could see where it goes away, but I, I won't. The songs he worked on for the most part, not all, but the songs he worked on for the most part are songs I don't like to begin with. And so, like, mm-hmm. I get that he was trying to do something different. Whether or not you like that Phil Spector sound, I do. So it didn't bother me as much. Like, when you hear Let It Be Naked, it's just a crappy, schmaltzy Paul McCartney song. And to mm-hmm. me, that's what this album has always been. It's bad Paul McCartney songs, pretty good John Lennon songs, and average George Harrison songs that feel like he's just punching the clock. Because I often find the George Harrison songs to be the the stellar gems on the albums, but these, to me, are not the two songs. You know, I think it's I, Me, Mine, right, is one of his, and For You, Blue, right? That's the two. And neither of those really stand out. They feel sort of wedged in, like they're almost giving him begrudgingly the song, which I know I think McCartney actually was at this point. I I hate the song Let It Be. I hate the song The Long and Winding Road. In fact, The Long and Winding Road might be my least favorite Beatles song. I just, it's uh, just, it's everything I don't like about Paul McCartney when he's not. The more I listen to the Beatles, I realize that, that McCartney needed Lennon more than Lennon needed McCartney, I think, which is, I know, a hot take, but it's hmm. it's not so much that they're not both great songwriters, but you can, like, Wings is what was going to happen, and Wings yeah, is what did happen. And yeah. it's like, okay, th- this is where, like, Wings is starting to happen. And God bless those that like Wings, and we're going to cover them, but that, to me... You know, I didn't always love everything John Lennon did solo career, but he was always interesting. At least to me, Wings was like unfiltered Paul McCartney. <laughs> and like, that's yeah. what the, I hear that here. And it's like, uh, you know, and once again, I, I think it's like kind of a mock to me, a kind of a silly controversy of what Spectre did. He, yeah, it doesn't sound like the Beatles if you think the Beatles sound like Paul McCartney. And what I see is like a guy like John Lennon and George Harrison looking to evolve and Paul McCartney kind of not. And that's probably where the difference is. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've always liked the song across the universe. I think it's a, it's a cool song. I know it's, there's a lot of people who really hate that song, which is always very interesting to me because to me, it's kind of classic Beatles mm-hmm. um, in terms of the type of songs they write a big hook sort of, I don't know it to me. It's the most call back to what the Beatles do, unless you say get back. Um, but yeah, I, this one would be, boy, I might, li- I might like this one better than Beatles for sale. I might, but I'm not sure. I mean, oh, wow. This, wow. That's it, so it's just well. a def- last. It is. It just, it, it, it's disjoin it, but not interesting disjoin it. I just think it's, it, it, it feels like the, the album that was pieced together, like a Franken album that mm-hmm. it, yep. it, it was. And it, that's yeah. as a result. And I mean, I, We've joked about, you know, Josh not loving Abbey Road and stuff, but like, boy, compared to Abbey Road, it <laughs> it yeah. just does does not hold a candle to that album at all or the yeah. White Album or anything in that era. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I like to look at Abbey Road as being the last album. I want them to go mm-hmm. out on a high note. And that's kind yeah. of and that was a much better experience and a more and, and a more cohesive album, even you know, even though they had this, all those songs at the second side kind of just jumbled together, but but it, they made it work somehow. For but me. they're all good. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's right. The difference. Right, and that too, right. Um, the other thing that's interesting, you mentioned the Harrison songs before I get to my commentary. Uh, it's interesting because that's one of Harrison's biggest issues is that he had all these songs and McCartney and Lennon were very dismissive of him and they didn't really put effort into playing his songs. Um, and so... He, and, and he had other songs like that went on all things must like he had all things must pass. Right. That was a song. And like that didn't make mm-hmm. it on here. He, he, he yeah. had better songs than that. And he they, they gave three like, al- weaker songs. Yeah. Three albums were at the songs, if I remember pretty correctly. Much, yes. Pretty much. Yeah. So um, so that's uh, J- Harrison hated <laughs> doing this album. But uh, um, and I, I agree. I, I really do like Across the Universe. Um, Actually, overall, this album, I do have mixed feelings with it. it, it I, I hear both of what you're saying i think there's elements of this that i really do like um i think my favorite song on here was i got a feeling i that's i love that song i think that is a deep a great deep mccartney song that um you know 
obviously it's not like it's not a well-known song, but usually when people think of McCartney, there's tons of other songs that they come, come to their minds before this. But, um, for that, I, I just, I've always liked that. Um, and, uh, I love the working with Lennon on it as well. Um, I do like get back. I agree that that's a great song. I, I don't know how you don't like across the universe, Josh. I, I would say that there's int- one of the interesting things about this record is there are so many different versions of some of these songs and across mm-hmm. the universe was actually done like a year before this was recorded. This was, that was the, that was the song that Lennon pretty much wrote when he was in India and they had tried it several times and they never really got exactly the recording that they wanted to. And the only reason that that is in this, um, on this album is because when they were filming the band rehearsing, Lennon was, they were playing parts of across the universe and they wanted that they wanted to make sure that the album that came out had the songs that were featured in the film. So it's kind of just by happenstance that they put that in there anyway. Um, but there are better versions of that song. That's one of the songs that, you know, Spectre put some orchestration in. Mm, okay. Um, so, uh, but you can hear on past masters, there's a different version, right. Um, and, and you know, like on a greatest hits album, there'll be a different version, but so, uh, but yes, I agree. The long and winding road is just, I agree, John, that is my least favorite Beatles song. Mm-hmm. It's just so, boring and plotting and there's no hook there's it's just like uh, it puts me to sleep and um it's a little bit better on let it be naked without the orchestration i don't know it's cheesy on this and there it's just even worse because it's boring cheesy yeah i don't i just don't like it i yeah i'm not pulling for it either way um you know so the the little songs like Dig It and Maggie May, those are kind of they're the, some of those Maggie May I think was like a fifteen minute jam that they actually did and they just cut the little snippet of it and put it in here. Mm. Um, and I think on Let It Be Naked they might actually there's like a bonus disc that comes with that, so they they extend some of these songs a little bit more. Um, and Maggie May is like a traditional like Liverpool song, like an old Liverpool song that Lennon always loved, and I think he played it with the Quarrymen, and you know mm. so um, that was them because again they're trying to bring this back to the you know to their old days one yeah. after 909 was a song that lennon wrote before the beatles were even formed so um that's a song that actually recorded back you know in 63 it just never made it to a record and they put it on that here so- that sounds like a early beatles song yeah. yeah um so yeah this is um yeah it's 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 a little sad listening to this it's just not you know it's not it does kind of stand out i still think that there's some strong moments but as an overall whole not not my favorite you know not even by a long shot i do have it kind of higher up than some other you know records i do i have it at number nine overall um yeah that's why i have it so. i have it behind magical mystery tour and ahead of uh beatles for sale so because i do think that there's still elements of this that i you know um, i still really like it's just um it, their stronger points are kind of stronger than on some of the other the records that that i have below it uh but yeah it's um I don't know. It's it is a weird album. It's probably the strangest album that they have. I would say. Um, mm. Yeah. Can I read the Paul McCartney letter because it's not oh, too please. long and it's yes. hilarious? Yeah. Yeah. So dated fourteenth April nineteen seventy, cc'd at the bottom to Phil Spector and John Eastman, signed by Paul McCartney. Dear sir, in future, no one will be allowed to add to or subtract from a recording of one of my songs without my permission. I had considered orchestrating the long and winding road, but I decided against it. I therefore want it altered to these specifications. One, strings, horns, voices, and all added noises to be reduced in volume. Two, vocal and beetle instrumentation to be brought up in volume. Three, harp to be removed completely at the end of the song and original piano notes to be substituted. Four, don't ever do it again. Signed, Paul McCartney. (laughs) And that was, you said that was on April 14th, John? April 14th, yes. So that was four days after Paul McCartney officially quit the Beatles. Yes. Um, You could just see him like, you know, doing the true Paul McCartney (laughs) passive aggressive thing right there. So I just imagine Phil Spector looking at this, you know, hey, we all know how Phil Spector ended up and, you know, it is what it is. A murder. Yeah. You can, <laughs> Pretty much. you can, you can tie it to the head injuries from that accident in 1974. You can say he was already going there before it. Right. But, uh, but at this okay, I just imagine him getting this letter typewritten letter and just lighting it on fire, yep. you know, and oh, yeah. then smoking a joint in it and then yeah. shooting it several yeah. times <laughs> with a shotgun. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but I think let it be naked to going back to that. I, that's the, that's the, version of this that you should listen to i think mm, um you okay. know it doesn't have the production josh it doesn't include uh, maggie may or dig it oh you don't you don't think so hot hot take it's not okay. better it's it's not oh. worse but it's not better either it's like 
It has Don't Let Me Down on it. It's better. It has Don't Let Me Down on it. Uh, I'll I'll give it that. Don't Let Me Down is all. uh, I mean, I I, I will go, this is a true hot take. It's a different type of mediocre album. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. It's another mediocre album just without certain elements that they produce that's different. It's a stripped down bad album. Granted, granted, the songs are still the songs, right? It's not like you yeah. hear it and you're like, holy cow, that's all this. You know, there's definitely some noticeable things that you will that you will be able to see. Um, but uh, it does have Don't Let Me Down. It takes out Dig It and Maggie Mae, which are kind of just there. Um, but uh, I, I do like the production of it better. But I, it, I, it's, yeah. I don't feel I have to be a Beatles apologist for an album that three of the four Beatles themselves didn't like. So, you know. That's mm-hmm. just kind of my I don't take. think they, I, I mean, even yeah, I don't think any of them really liked it. You know, it was kind of... Uh, well, and George Harrison releases an awesome set of yes. albums after this. Instant Karma by John Lennon comes out soon after this, and that's a very good album. Uh-huh. Um, and Paul made his Paul did, music. Paul yeah. did McCartney. Yeah. Yep. And R- Ringo actually made a better Paul album than Paul made <laughs> later and hit number one first, if I remember correctly. So, um, yeah. So, yeah I, I, so that's that's... You just look at those albums that John Lennon and George Harrison made here, and I'm just like, that's yeah. where the songs were, and yep. they just and they knew it, you know. And that's why I think this album's always fascinating because at this point, I think they just hoarded some. Well, maybe George Harrison didn't want to hoard them, but I think John Lennon at this point was like, oh, I'm saving all my best stuff for what Yoko and I are doing. So, well, I'm, I, I'm excited. I, I was going to say I'm excited to see that Peter Jackson documentary that's coming out this year about this. Yeah. After and, listening to this and yeah, all that's the other called Beatles that's like August this year. I think it's the Beatles get back and and it's yeah. w- one of the things it supposedly shows is like them all being happy. You know, I actually posted a clip on Twitter um, about that and it, it, this album is known for being a miserable experience. But they but Peter Jackson's finding all this footage saying they actually there's a lot of fun moments in there that they're having. You know that they're enjoying themselves. So. Um, so, yeah, the other interesting thing about when Let It Be Naked was released was apparently there was a two hour radio broadcast after when it was released um, that included interviews from the Beatles um, and a 20 minute roundtable discussion that included Cheryl Crow, Billy Joel, NSYNC's JC Chazez or Chazez or whatever that Chazé guy is. is Chazé. The, get it right or pay the price, Matt. <laughs> Chazé. I'll pay the price. Yes. Limp Biscuits, Fred Durst. What? And Geraldo Rivera. <laughs> <laughs> What the, exactly. How do you even pick that? <laughs> I don't know. Oh Did the manatees God. push the balls across the tent? Is that the tank? Is that how they pick that? So. <laughs> I just, I was like, I that somebody just made all that up. Um, so yeah, so technically Lennon Lennon quit the band unofficially in September of '69, but McCartney publicly quit in April of '70. Um, and later on in that year, McCartney filed suit for the dissolution of the Beatles' contractual partnership. Uh, but it was, but due to legal you know, cases, it was not actually formalized until December 29th, 1974. Uh, Lennon did sign the paperwork, terminating the partnership while on vacation with his family in Walt Disney World. <laughs> Which, uh, <laughs> I found funny. I, I always like John Lennon. He just has a, has a panache to him that, you know, just mm-hmm. makes him my favorite Beatle. Yeah. And the, uh, the Beatles were inducted, surprise, surprise, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1988. Uh, 73 different times, right? As individuals, as the Beatles, probably in the well, quarry well, only, men. Like. Only once as the actual Beatles, and McCartney did not attend. He cited unresolved business differences that would make him feel, quote, feel like a complete hypocrite waving and smiling with them like with them at a fake reunion. Wait, when did the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame start? I thought it was like the mid-80s. Um. I don't. I think the Beatles were the first ones to be inducted, or the Maybe first the year. Was um, the first so year. eighty-eight might have been the first year, but that might be a cleaning the stacks. Um, I can look it up real quick. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, Josh is right. So I am looking forward to seeing that Peter Jackson film. Jackson film. Actually, this, this the film was supposed to be called Get Back originally. So you you read a lot in Wikipedia about oh it's you know the album's going to be Get Back, but since it took so long for the album to be released or the movie to be released, they wanted it. Get Back was actually a single already in early '69, so they wanted a they wanted to title it something that was more relevant to a single that they released. So um, that was Let It Be. Um, I think '86 well, was the first year. Yeah. 86, and the Rock okay. and Roll Hall of Fame was established in 83. Yeah, I remember just okay. George Harrison being up there by himself, basically, and saying, this is a real shame, you know? <laughs> that, oh, man. Paul, Paul, Paul wasn't there, and obviously John wasn't there. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think Ringo was there, Ringo too. had to be there. Yeah, I think the two of them were there, and they were kind of like, isn't this a shame? So Yeah, that's too yeah. bad. Yep. Well, Same year as the Beach Boys. 
Well, it makes sense, so, you know, Dylan. if you're going to pick the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> so those I mean, first couple those first couple of years must have been like Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard and all those guys, right? Yes. And like uh-huh. Buddy Holly. The Who, does. Led Zeppelin. Yeah, I'm sure. Sam it's like, Cooke. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm talking Barry. about like, bef- like those, Barry, first, yeah. those first two years. Yeah, yeah. it's it's stacked. <laughs> yeah. It's, I'm going to not look at that and try to write it down and see how well I do. And can I give a spicy hot take, even though we're running at the end of things here? And so I'm going to have to give this and then run away from it. So Matt's going to be so angry at me for this. I'm I'll already give angry you space. at you. I'll give you space next episode. Here's my spiciest hot take. As influential and great as the Beatles were in modern music, I think Funkadelic and Black Sabbath are more influential to modern music than the Beatles. Oh, there we go. That's my take right there. So Yeah, I mean, maybe so. I, yep. I, I, that's a hard, how do you define, how do you quantify that? that? Well, maybe that'll be the essential question next week. So maybe I can lead that segment, but, uh,